So I just want to start by uh, reviewing something which we discussed at the end of the last lecture, which is uh, this evidence on how unemployment benefit extensions affect unemployment durations and subsequent match quality. But I actually want to make a couple of methodological points about the RD design because I think I wasn't totally clear and we've got a few questions afterward. So the first thing I want to point out, so when you look at a graph like this, so remember what this is, is uh, from our paper with uh, David Hart and Andrea Weber, um, looking at this discontinuity in the Australian data where if you're to the right of that cutoff, you've worked for more than three years within the past five years, you're eligible for um, an additional 10 weeks of unemployment benefits, 30 weeks instead of 20 weeks. Okay? And so what's the idea of the RD design? We compare the people just to the left of the discontinuity with the people just to the right. So a few people ask, you know, isn't it problematic that the trend looks totally different on the right relative to the left? Or if you go like further away from the cutoff, actually the unemployment durations are lower on the right side than on the left side. At some level, this graph I think actually kind of illustrates the beauty of the RD design. The point is that we just did an OLS comparison of people with 30 weeks of benefits and people with 20 weeks of benefits. You would falsely conclude that the unemployment benefit length has no effect or maybe even a negative effect. And the whole idea of the RD design is that it makes no difference what's going on away from the cutoff. We're purely identified by the discontinuous jump at the cutoff itself. And it makes no difference if the slope is changing on the left or the right. That has no impact on the estimate. Presumably, all of that is due to selection or some other uh, thing that's changing in a smooth way across the distribution. So that naturally raises a, you know, a couple of other questions just about the standard methodological practice. So RD, as you probably know, is like one of the most popular estimators today because people find it much more compelling than difference in difference or other types of strategies. And I think the fundamental reason for that is you see very clearly like various contrasts visually, right? So you can see that the patterns are actually quite stable and then they jump discontinuously right here. So you should you know, make sure to know like standard methodological practice. There's a good um, paper by uh, David Lee and Tom Lemieux uh, in the JEL that uh, reviews some of these uh, issues. Uh, but let me just make a couple of other points here. So how do we account for the fact that there are smooth trends away from the cutoff? So in this particular case, we're using a parametric approach where we have a cubic control function on the left and the right, so where uh, you know, the way you fit these models is you have uh, an indicator for crossing the cutoff, and then you have a, uh, you fit some relatively high order polynomial on the left and the right to account for the fact that you might have these uh, smooth trends away from the cutoff, and then you estimate the size of this continuity, right? Another way to do it is like with a local linear regression as you're sort of narrowing the bandwidth around uh, the cutoff. One final comment that I'll make is uh, how do you think about standard errors in this context? So uh, in these types of designs, particularly when you have population data, people often ask, you know, what, what is the source of the noise? And what you can see from this graph is that the key source of noise in a design like this is not so much sampling errors. So when you have like a million observations, the problem is not that there's individual level noise, it's that there's specification error, meaning this polynomial is not ne necessarily accurately capturing the true non-parametric pattern in the data because you're trying to fit that with a smooth function. So one way you can see that that's a problem here, that that polynomial is generating errors, is that there's clustering in where the points are above and below the line. They're not sort of randomly distributed <coughs> above and below the line. You can see that there's there are clumps, right? So it tends to underfit here and overfit there and so forth. And that shows you that it's not random individual level sampling error that's a problem because that stuff would just can't, you know, average out in a sense. It would be randomly distributed around the, the fit. Instead, the problem is this issue of specification error that you don't have the right specification. And so what that, what specification error does is it creates correlation in the errors ac across the observations that are near each other. So in particular, suppose we had divided the data even more finely. Instead of months, suppose we did it in days. Then you're going to find that the guys with similar days of, uh, year, days of number of work, 
sorry, the number of days they worked prior to the job loss, those people are going to have very correlated unemployment durations relative to the specification that you imposed. And so you're going to get correlated errors for the people who are in nearby bins. And so the standard practice to deal with that, uh, which is in a paper by Lee and Card, is to cluster your standard errors by something like the binning variable. So the idea is that we know that all the guys within this dot, they probably have correlated errors relative to the fit, not because they're similar people who have similar unemployment durations, but because they're all going to be systematically above or below the line. And so that's going to lead you to overstate your precision if you don't ac account for the fact that the errors are correlated. All right, so just as, you know, as a matter of standard practice, you cluster your standard errors by the binning variable or something coarser than that to account for the fact that you have the specification error. All right, so taking all of that into account, substantively what the point of this uh, graph is, you'll recall, is that when you extend unemployment benefits, despite the various trends and so forth, you do see that people take longer to find jobs, but you don't see impacts on uh, match quality, which is what we discussed at the end of the last lecture. Okay, any questions on the RD methods? Okay, so I want to continue now with a few other sort of miscellaneous things in the unemployment insurance literature, and then we're going to move on to other social insurance programs today. So I think the most uh, striking evidence for uh, the distortionary effects of social insurance in the literature is not actually what we've been seeing, which is the effect of unemployment benefits on durations of unemployment or unemployment rates, but rather a very particular pattern in the hazard rates, which is very uh, widely cited and well known, which is called the spike in the hazard rate at benefit exhaustion. So this was originally identified in papers by uh, Larry Katz and Bruce Meyer and has subsequently be been replicated in several studies. So uh, I, I want to make a distinction between what these papers measure and what matters for the types of models we've been talking about, the types of job search models we've been discussing. So the traditional me measure of what the hazard, uh, of the way that hazard is measured in these, in these papers is exiting the unemployment insurance system. Okay, so the definition of uh, the hazard rate is the fraction of people who exit the unemployment system divided by the number who were unemployed in a given week. That is different than the measure that matters from a theoretical point of view, which is whether you find a job or not. So why are those two things not equivalent? Because you can go off the unemployment system without finding a job, right? So you might say, you know, I'm not going to go back, for instance, to pick up my last unemployment check or for whatever reason, I don't want to deal with the hassle of the UI system. And so I end up leaving the system, but that doesn't, that's not what we're interested in from a social welfare perspective. What we're interested in is whether you're actually working again, okay? So, uh, and you know, that's a particularly important issue in the European context where you can actually remain uh, registered on the UI system indefinitely in many countries in order to get uh, job search assistance. And so there's a real distinction between being on the UI system and being, uh, um, sorry, being employed. So I want to show you uh, the result from Katz and Meyer and then what, uh, you know, why this distinction between the two types of uh, exit is important. So this is the basic picture from Bruce Meyer's 1990 paper, which shows you the unemployment exit hazard plotted non-parametrically by the number of weeks of eligibility you have left. So remember that typically in the US, people get about 26 weeks of unemployment benefits, but that can vary depending upon the amount of earnings you had and various other parameters. So the way Bruce thinks about it is, let's put on the x-axis how many weeks of eligibility you have left and plot the fraction of people who are finding jobs or actually who are exiting the unemployment system uh, in every week relative to that end date. And the pattern that you see, which is very salient, is that this hazard rate rises very sharply at the end of the, toward the point at which you exhaust benefits. And in particular, in the week before you exhaust benefits, there's a much higher hazard rate. Okay, so the interpretation of this in the literature was that lots of people are hanging out on the UI system and living off of the unemployment benefits and then going back to work right when their benefits run out, which looks like strong evidence of moral hazard and something that you don't you know, necessarily want to be supporting, right? 
Okay, so I think the issue with this is the following. So if you look at actual data on finding jobs rather than exiting the unemployment system, uh, you get a different picture. So this is from another paper that I wrote with uh, David Card and Andre Weber using the Austrian data again, where in the Austrian data you can not only see whether people exited the unemployment system, but also whether they found a new job because you're tracking people in this panel, right? And you have both unemployment and employment records. And so we plot two hazards here. The red is the unemployment exit hazard and the benefits are available for 20 weeks after which you continue to get job search assistance and some other means tested benefits. But there's a discontinuous change in the benefits that you're eligible for at 20 weeks. And consistent with the US data, you see a big spike in the hazard of exiting the unemployment system right at the point when your benefits expire. However, and this is the important point, you don't see nearly as clear, and maybe none at all, uh, of a spike in the probability of finding a job around that point. It's not nearly as sharp, right? It's an order of magnitude smaller. Yeah. Unemployment exit is defined as not being registered on the unemployment system anymore. Oh, so that explains why it's so positive. Exactly. If it was mechanically like, are you receiving unemployment benefits, then this number would by definition have to be 100% at this point, right? But that's the difference between the European system and the US system. In the European system, you can continue to remain on the UI system after the benefits expire, or in, or in the Austrian case. That's not true in the US. So notice in the US, this graph, this point here is not zero, it's minus one. At zero, that number goes to 100% mechanically in the US. That's not the interesting thing. The point is the hazard jumps up uh, in the week before. Correct. Correct. Exactly. I mean, one interpret. We, so we don't know exactly what's going on in the U.S. in this last week, but one speculative interpretation is that the way the UI benefits work is you're eligible for a certain lump sum amount of benefits based on your past earnings history, and then that gets divided into weeks. And so what can end up happening is that the last week's benefit amount, because it's not divided perfectly ends up being very, you know, relatively small, might be just like $20 or something. And then you end up not going to pick up that check and it shows up in the records as a lot of people leaving in, in week 25. Okay. The point is you want to be looking at whether you actually found a job or not, right? That's, that's essentially what I'm saying. Okay, so that's for the week with, uh, that's for the people in the Austrian system with 20 weeks of eligibility. And then remember I had told you there are a set of people with 30 weeks of eligibility. So you see the spike moves over to 30 weeks as you'd expect. And then we take the difference between these two series to try to identify the impacts on the job finding hazards, which are harder to detect visually just when you look at the, the basic patterns. And so this is the difference between the series on the previous two slides. So the difference in hazard rates between the people eligible for 20 weeks of UI and 30 weeks of UI. And you see that in fact, there is actually clear evidence of an excess job finding hazard around the points, the point when benefits expire for the 20 week guys and a shortfall uh, when the benefits expire for the 30 week guys because the 30 week guys have higher hazards at those points. So it is actually true that there are a bunch of people who uh, find a job right when benefits run out, but it's trivial in magnitude relative to the spikes that you would see in uh, unemployment system exit rates, okay? And we do some calculation, calculation suggesting that this uh, spike in exhaustion or this you know, timing of uh, returning to work right when benefits run out accounts for a very small fraction of the overall impact of UI on unemployment rates and unemployment durations. So that's why I stress the unemployment duration effect as being much more important. That is the impact that the system is having throughout the distribution here, and not just this fine retiming thing, which looks visually very salient the way it was measured, but I think in practice is actually not uh, that important. Okay. Questions? Okay, so we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, 
unemployment insurance, the optimal design of unemployment insurance purely from the worker's perspective. And the reason we did not worry about who was actually laying you off, that is the firms, is that we implicitly assumed that the UI system was perfectly experience rated, meaning every time you know, GM lays off one more worker, they effectively have to pay for that, and so their incentives are totally undistorted, in which case you could essentially take the firms out of the, out of the problem. Okay, so now let's turn to the <coughs> thinking about what unemployment insurance does to firm behavior and how we might think about the optimal design of the system from the firm's perspective. So in practice, UI is not perfectly experience rated in the US and in other countries. Um, and so in a pair of influential papers in the late 70s, Marty Feldstein showed first, <laughs> theoretically and quite intuitively, that imperfect experience rating can raise the rate of temporary layoffs as firms have an incentive to lay off workers and then hire them back to take advantage of basically a paid vacation at the expense of the government, right? Um, and second, empirically, that this effect is actually fairly important in practice. So here's the problem, just to illustrate what the issue is. So uh, suppose you have on the x-axis what we call the benefit ratio for the firm. That is the uh, amount of UI benefits that are paid due to the firm, to, due to a given firm's layoffs, divided by that firm's payroll. Okay, so think of this as like the percentage cost that the firm is imposing on the UI system by laying off workers. Then in order for the system to be perfectly experience rated, that is not distort the firm's incentives, you would need the tax rate that you impose on the firm to be shown by the red line, to be perfectly linear. That is, as you lay off more workers and you know increase cost by X percent, your tax rate goes up by X percent. <coughs> In practice, here's an example of what the tax schedule actually looks like. Like take the state of Washington in 2005. This is typical. It looks actually fairly uh, perfectly experience rated at low levels. In fact, if anything, it's slightly steeper than perfect experience rating. So you're actually paying a price to lay off workers. Um, but then there's a cap. And the reason the cap is really important is if you think about who is going to be laying off a lot of workers, Layoffs tend to be concentrated in certain sets of firms that are declining. And so suppose you have one firm that's laying off lots of people and another firm that's not really laying off very many. Then you've got perfect experience rating for the guy who's not laying off anyone. And you've got essentially zero experience rating for, you know, let's say a company that's totally crashing and is laying off lots of workers. So from a worker, an unemployed worker perspective, the uh, a average experience rating, even if the average firm is well experience rated, when weighted by the amount of unemployment that they're generating, the level of experience rating can be very low. Okay, so, and that's the reason why Feldstein finds that empirically this is quite important. Because when you weight by the amount of unemployment, each number of workers each firm is laying off, you get a lot of people in this part of the, in this part of the curve. Okay? So let's first start uh, with just a very simple uh, description of the theoretical model, which is very easy to understand, uh, for why this matters for layoffs and for welfare. So in Feldstein's model, firms offer workers stochastic contracts. So now it's a two-dimensional contract where firms are offering you a wage rate and a probability of temporary layoff. Okay, so you come to a firm, and basically the way to think about it is there are different types of jobs you can get. They naturally pay different amounts, but they also have different probabilities that you will get laid off. Or think of it as different probabilities of seasonal employment. <coughs> and suppose there are two states of the macroeconomy, high demand and low demand. In equilibrium, this is the main uh, result Feldstein establishes, competitive firms are going to offer uh, workers a contract that pays as marginal product in expectation over the two states at the cheapest cost to the firm. So, um, you know, so that's going to generate what's the main result. So uh, we know that perfect competition um, is going to drive you toward paying workers their marginal product. That's, uh, that would occur in a standard model. But here, when you have these two states, you have this uncertainty. You're going to pay workers their marginal product in expectation, and you're going to try to do that in a way – 
that costs you the least as the firm, right? And so what does that mean? Uh, when you have imperfect experience trading, you generate profits by laying off workers, right? So it's efficient from the firm's point of view uh, to, to pay workers not a fixed wage, but to lay them off with some probability so that the worker and the firm can benefit from the fact that the government is basically going to give them some money in one state of the world. You want to take advantage of that, uh, the subsidy that you're getting uh, in the low state. And so what ends up happening in this model is uh, if you think about um, what the worker wants, Remember, the worker has concave utility. So suppose I start out with a contract where I pay the worker a fixed wage of W across the two states. All right. Um, now, so that's a case where the worker is perfectly insured. Now, what you can see in an uh, expected utility model is you will always be willing to tolerate a small amount of risk. Like suppose I say, your wage might be down here at W1 or here at W2. Okay, so I introduce a little bit of risk. If I, that has a second order cost to you from a utility point of view because the marginal utility of consumption is to first order essentially the same just above and just below this point. Okay, so this is going to have a small cost imposing a little bit of risk on you. But there's going to be a first order benefit in terms of profits for the firm because the government subsidy is directly proportional to laying off the worker. Okay, so mathematically, that's what makes it optimal to lay off workers with a small probability because you impose a little bit of risk on them and they don't mind that so much, but you generate first order profits, okay? And you can transfer those profits back to the worker um, and uh, the worker is gonna be better off. Or another way to look at it is basically you generate more surplus and that's going to you know, be split in some way between the worker and the firms in equilibrium, but it's going to be optimal to do that in a, in a competitive equilibrium. Yeah. Um, okay, so what does Feldstein do empirically? I'll be pretty brief here because methodologically this is very similar to other papers we've discussed. So as I said, his first observation is that more than half the firms are above the max rate or below. There's also a min rate in some states. So more than half the firms are in a situation where they have no experience rating on the margin, meaning they're just one for one imposing an externality on others when they lay people off. So he then uses cross state and time variation and UI benefits of the usual type that we've been discussing uh, where uh, UI laws are changed. You don't have a tremendous amount of data, especially at that time, so there's quite a bit of imprecision here. But his central point estimate is that a 10% increase in UI benefits causes a 7% increase in temporary layoff unemployment. So that's actually a huge effect. And he argues that a huge part of temporary layoff unemployment, like half of it at the time in the US, could be due to the existence of the UI system. That is, lots of people are experiencing these temporary layoffs purely because of the, the UI system itself. And so I think the Feldstein papers are actually quite influential in uh, making the system much more heavily experience rated than it was uh, at that time. He also shows that the effect is twice as large for union members as non-union members, which is kind of, I think, along the lines of Pascal's question that suggests that there's some sort of intertemporal coordination going on, right? That these guys who you know you're going to have around, you, you do more of this sort of thing. So. Then there's a subsequent paper by Tepel. You can see that, you know, unlike many other parts of the class, the papers I'm discussing here are actually relatively uh, dated. And that's because this literature is not uh, tremendously active at the moment. But I think one could probably do uh, good empirical work in this area with, with much better data. So um, Feldstein's paper does not directly show that imperfect experience rating itself is to blame for more temporary layoffs because he's not directly looking at variation in the amount of experience rating. So if you want to pin this on experience rating, you want to show that there is less temporary layoff unemployment 
when you have more experience rating. You don't want to use variation in just the level of unemployment benefits, right? So that's what this uh, well-known paper by Tapal does. Use a state by industry variation in uh, the financing of UI. Essentially, that generates uh, variation in the tax rate that firms face from these min and max thresholds for experience rating, right? So you can see, like, suppose Minnesota has one type of schedule, you know, one type of cap, and uh, Wisconsin has some other type of cap that's higher. Then for one industry, which is at the, at the cap in um, uh, Minnesota in a given year, it might not be at the cap in uh, Wisconsin, and that's going to generate differential variation across industries and states that you can use. Sorry, I just mean, um, that's not good terminology, but I just mean exactly this, that the marginal tax rate that these firms face for laying off workers um, varies because of where they are on the schedule. Potentially, potentially. But I mean, if you do this right, and then this paper, I'm not saying that it necessarily does exactly this the way you'd want to do a quasi-experimental design today. But you can imagine how you'd handle that kind of thing by looking at temporal variation in which industries, you know, like the auto industry might be declining in this year and you're not going to pick up your auto plant and move it to, you know, Wisconsin for two years and then bring it back, right? So stuff like that. Uh, again, I mean, I think the nature of empirical work at that time was different from the type of studies we've been discussing. So I think there's room to do this more precisely. Um, okay, so here... His main estimate is that imperfect experience rating accounts for 30% of all temporary unemployment, a layoff unemployment. Again, a, you know, pretty large effect. So there are some more recent studies that find, I think, broadly similar results. Like we think experience rating does actually matter. Firms figure this out. Um, arguably, the effects are not quite this big, but as I've been stressing, I think there's more work to be done. Is temporary layoff on a That's a good question. Um, it was actually quite substantial in the 70s, late 70s and 80s. It has declined dramatically. So I don't know the number off the top of my head for today, but it's not a very big share. And so I think this problem actually is not nearly as important today as it was uh, in the late 70s. And that r relates to you know the decline in manufacturing and things like that, broader trends, why temporary on layoff unemployment is not that important. But, uh, you know, this also ties back to the question earlier about whether it's all about temporary layoffs. That I think that's one easy to identify channel where you might get effects of imperfect experience rating. But you shouldn't conclude that that's the only thing that would be distorted, right? Even if I'm laying you off once and for all and not planning to hire you back, my decision to lay you off might be distorted by the fact that it's not so costly for you if I lay you off. And that still has an efficiency cost, and that's still distortionary. So it's not like imperfect experience rating only affects temporary layoff unemployment. I think it's where you're able to see the effects clearly. Okay, so that's uh, you know that's pretty much what I'm going to say about the firm side. You can see that there's not only like not that much development on the empirical side, but also in terms of connecting back to the theory. Like we don't really have an answer to the type of uh, question Vijay raised about whether um, uh, about whether this is optimal in the sense that do you want to have more experience rating, less experience rating? We don't have a sort of a formula for figuring out what are the trade-offs here in terms of giving firms capital versus aligning incentives. And I think all of that is uh, interesting stuff to, to figure out. Okay, so another uh, topic now in this list of sort of miscellaneous things on UI. So, so far we've been thinking about um, a social insurance system that has a very specific design structure in the sense that I collect taxes from you in the good state and I pay you money in the bad state. It's pure state contingent transfers. But when you think about it, you know, more generally, there's no reason that that's the only way you can set up an insurance system, especially in a dynamic environment where you, you can transfer money to people in good versus bad states in other ways. And so one proposal that actually has gotten a fair bit of attention recently among various economists is an 
savings accounts based system for risk instead of transfers. So the basic like abstract logic of this is that many shocks that people face are transitory rather than permanent. And so in that environment, you can do a pretty good job self-insuring, as I've mentioned in an earlier lecture, rather than transferring money across states, right? So if I'm just going to be unemployed for six weeks, I can pretty much smooth consumption just fine if I am able to uh, access my permanent income rather than just rely on my current income. And so uh, one way you might think about setting that up in the context of UI, but also, you know, Feldstein has proposed this and this has been adopted uh, in the U.S. to some extent in the for, for health savings accounts or various other types of risks uh, is, so what you do is instead of paying a, the UI tax to the government, you pay that money into your own UI savings account. So it's like you, you build up this buffer stock instead of paying taxes uh, to the government that will end up financing these transfers. So the Feldstein and Altman plan has three parts. So you pay the UI tax into the UI savings account. If you're unemployed, you deplete the balance of that savings account according to the current benefit schedule. Okay, just to be concrete, uh, suppose for instance you don't change the level of UI benefits. If you lose your job, you get exactly the same benefit, but it's paid out of your own account rather than coming from a transfer from uh, the central government. And then some people are going to run out of money, right? So like let's say I have been working for only a year or two, so I've deposited only a small amount of money in this account. I lose my job. I'm going to uh, hit the corner where I have no money left in this UI savings account. And so the Feldstein Altman plan is that the government then pays the benefit as in the current system. So you revert back to the current system, which is financed using a tax, but that tax is going to end up being smaller than what you need to finance the whole current UI system because a lot of it is coming out of these accounts. Uh, all right, so, but, so before I move on, let me just complete this thought that what this paper does is just show you practically how this would work, but writing down a normative model where such a system is optimal, I think is a separate question and interesting one to think about. I actually think this type of thing might actually, there could be some logic for it and it would have to have something to do with framing where somehow you recognize, like I could imagine a situation where people think all these taxes that I have to pay, payroll taxes, you know, I have no idea what that does for me, but I do not, uh, you know, I get less money when I go home and I want to work less because of that. But if it's paid into a, you, like the savings account where I recognize that my balance is going up, maybe you actually have a beneficial effect on the labor supply decision to begin with, even if you don't end up affecting search behavior once you're unemployed. So something like that, I think, is the type of mechanism one needs to explore. It's, I think, very interesting uh, questions in behavioral public. But, so that's exactly right. And so then I want to stress, in their simulation, the benefits that are being paid out are identical to the current system. So it's all about how the costs change, right? So the idea is that <coughs> we still pay out exactly the same amount, but because two-thirds of the guys are in the interior, maybe they behave in a more desirable way. And so then you end up essentially incurring a lower cost. Okay, so here's the, a key piece of this that comes to the question of distribution and whether people would be able to achieve this themselves. So one thing you would think such a system would do, in addition to potentially changing incentives, is redistribute money across people in different parts of the income distribution. So in particular, we know that the incidence of unemployment is higher at the low end of the income distribution, and you're eligible you essentially get more out of the UI system because it's somewhat redistributive in the sense that uh, benefits are capped at a certain level, right, as we've seen. Uh, and so if you're a very high income guy, you're not getting that much out of the UI system relative to the tax that you're paying in, in some sense. It's, that's not literally true, but it's along those lines. So for this reason, the current UI system transfers money from high income people to lower income people. And so, you know, one thing that they want to evaluate is what is the distributional incidence of switching to such a policy? And what you can see here, and this is, you know, they, they stress that this actually doesn't look so bad because while the high income guys gain quite a bit per capita, about $500 per capita um, in present value from switching to such a system, 
because they're not paying for somebody else's UI benefits. The low income guys actually do not lose that much. Okay, but that should strike you as being somewhat odd because where is the money coming from, right? Uh, nobody's changing their behavior in this model. So that could potentially make sense if you're incorporating the fact that people stay unemployed for less time because then the size of the economic pie has become bigger and you could end up having these numbers add up to something that's non-zero. But the way the simulation is done, there's no change in... Uh, there's no change in behavior. We assume that everybody stays unemployed for exactly the same amount of time as they did under the current system. So given that mechanically, the, the total net present value gain of switching the system has to be zero because you have not created any additional surplus. So now this comes to the question of, you know, does this show you that people could achieve this on, the, on their own? The, the key assumption that's important here and is actually also quite important in the social security privatization debate, it's the same thing, um, is that in these calculations, they're discounting at a 2% interest rate but in order to calculate present values, but they assume that you earn interest at a 5.5% rate. Okay, so why is that crucial? Because if you're in such an environment, then making people save increases surplus, irrespective of whatever else you do, right? So forget about the whole complicated change in UI system. Suppose I just made everybody save an extra $10,000. That would increase everyone's uh, present value just because the interest rate's higher than the discount rate. So, you know, can you justify that assumption? Maybe if you think that there's some market imperfection that's driving a wedge between the discount rate and the interest rate. But you would think if, you know, in a normal model where people are optimizing, there would not be a difference between these two things. And that also, we're not going to talk about Social Security in this class, but let me make one point. I mean, I think this is like a core uh, issue in this debate about privatizing Social Security. If you think that this is true, then privatizing Social Security is a great idea because you basically make people save more and that's free money because it's, uh, you're able to earn this high rate of return without uh, discounting, uh, without you know, a very high discount rate. If you think these two rates are much more similar, as Peter Diamond would argue, uh, then privatizing Social Security doesn't look like nearly um, as good of an idea. So, you know, that's a central uh, question. Okay, so uh, next issue that people have thought about um, is take up in the context of UI and in the context of other social insurance programs. So, uh, the, the general finding here, which is a well-known puzzle, is that the mean take-up rate for these social insurance programs is very low. So, <coughs> for instance, in the context of unemployment insurance, about 70% of the people who are eligible for benefits actually go and get the benefits. So that's kind of weird, certainly weird from the rational model because, you know, you're just leaving free money on the table, right? You could just go get that money. Uh, and in the models that we've been talking about, we've totally ignored take up because we've assumed that everybody who's eligible for the benefit gets the benefit. But in practice, that's only true for 70%. So what is driving imperfect take up? How does that affect optimal UI? There's some work on that. On the question of what's driving take up, as in many other situations, you find some mix of rational behavior on the margin and what I think are behavioral explanations for um, inframarginal low take-up rates. So what I mean in this context is there's a paper by Anderson and Meyer in the QJE which shows that the after-tax UI replacement rate affects the level of take-up. So in other words, when I have higher UI benefits, more people take up the benefit. So that looks like rational in the sense that it's a hassle to go get your UI benefits, sign up, etc. If the benefit level is high enough, you might do it, otherwise you don't. So you know, it seems like some of it could be driven by like a rational fixed cost model, at least on the margin. Um, but, you know, I think there's other evidence suggesting that that can't be all of it because some of the money that's being left on the table is quite a bit, like a few thousand dollars for people who not only have low incomes, but particularly at the time that they're unemployed, have no money. So it's a little bit surprising that they're not, it's, you'd have to have implausibly high fixed costs to explain the mean level of take up. 
Uh, and you see similar problems, as I was mentioning, in food stamps, where take-up rates are like 50 or 60 percent. EITC was actually higher, more like 85 percent. Um, but in general, you know, take-up is low. So what are some possible, you know, behavioral explanations? Uh, myopia, again, so how, what would myopia do here? I think that I'm going to find a job in a week. Like, I don't want to bother with the unemployment system. It actually ends up taking me 20 weeks. Um, uh, stigma, okay, so maybe in the context of UI, I think more important in the context of welfare or public housing. Like, I may not want to feel like I'm living off the government or have other people think that I'm dependent on the government, so I don't go take UI. Hassle, you know, sort of like a, um, that could be a rational explanation, or maybe you overweight the hassle, costs of taking up, or maybe a lack of information. Like, I didn't know that I could get unemployment benefits, or I didn't know how big they would be. Yeah. So, I don't know how it works uh, currently, but I know in the past that you had to go, this is what we were talking about earlier, you had to go claim your checks every so often in person, I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, and I think now you can actually sign up by telephone or on the, uh, on the web. So the hassle costs have been reduced. And in fact, there were students at Berkeley who looked at when uh, they switched to the telephone take up, did that raise take up rates, but they found no impact. Uh, so I don't know, maybe that suggests that the hassle is not a big deal. So I'm gonna talk about one paper in this context, uh, which is a paper by Black et al. in the AER in 2003. This paper actually was not supposed to be about take up, but I think it is about take up in the end. Uh, so this is an experiment in Kentucky where some UI claimants were randomly assigned to receive reemployment services, so training services, right? Which, and the idea of the experiment was to see if things like assisted job search, employment counseling, job search workshops, retraining programs, would these things help people find jobs? So they had about 1,000 people who were required to receive these services in order to get UI benefits, and a control group who just got regular UI, where you had to say you were searching for a job, but there was no specific training requirement. Okay, so the idea of this thing was to evaluate whether the training uh, helps people find jobs faster. Should we do more training? And you end up finding that, in fact, the treatment group does find a job more quickly. But when you look at the timing more carefully, it doesn't look like it's for the reason you would have hoped. So you get unemployed and file your claim in week zero. Here's what the timing looks like. You get your first check, typically, let's say, in week two. And then they sent out these letters uh, that said, uh, we're going to require you to do this training thing to continue to get UI benefits. And then they um, provided the training over the subsequent weeks. <clears throat> so here's so um, here's the pattern that you see uh, in the data. Uh, so these are hazard rates of exiting unemployment for the treatment group and the control group. And th so the main point of the paper is that the hazard rates are actually higher for the treatment group, meaning the treatment group finds jobs more quickly. But when you look at the timing of it, and this illustrates the value of looking at the hazard non-parametrically rather than just running a regression, it's too early. It's actually right when you get the letter that people are more likely to leave the system, not when they actually get the training. So that's why I think this is about take up and maybe about hassle. It's like, I don't want to have to deal with this training thing. I'll instead just not get the unemployment benefits. And so you end up finding the training program has beneficial effects, but not because you're providing the training, right? Uh, so uh, then they estimate these regression models. I'm actually going to skip that in the interest of time. So what's the bottom line message of this paper? The treatment group exits the UI system earlier, uh, receives 2.2 fewer weeks of benefits on average, but most of the increase seems to be driven by the notification rather than actually the uh, provision of these services. And that's actually a more... More generally, there are a bunch of studies on training efforts, and you rarely find that training actually works in terms of um, uh, getting people back to work more quickly, unfortunately. Uh, so one more, uh, so another issue on UI, which we touched on very briefly at one point, and I'll just say a quick word about it so you're aware of it. So all the models we've been talking about are uh, 
partial equilibrium in the sense that the uh, types of jobs that are being offered and the wages that are being paid are not endogenously responding to the existence of the system. So in this paper in the uh, JP in 1999, Asimoglu and Scheimer point out, as someone I think had anticipated in an early lecture, that UI can actually be efficiency enhancing in equilibrium. So in the standard model that we've been discussing, UI strictly lowers output, right? Because it just distorts people's incentives and they stay out of work longer. But the set of jobs that are being offered, because we assume like constant returns to production, they're just, they are fixed. But in practice, you might think that there's a potentially important GE effect where more risky jobs are provided in equilibrium if people are better insured. So, you know, think about like to take a, a simple example, um, uh, you know, suppose I can choose one of two sectors to work in, like the tech sector, which is very risky, but potentially I invent something great, or another sector which is very safe where I earn a lower uh, steady wage. Without any insurance, I might choose to avoid the tax sector. But with good insurance, we might have more tech jobs in equilibrium and we might have a higher rate of growth in the economy because when you average over all the people, some guys are gonna do well in that sector and raise total output. So you can see how the provision of insurance might actually end up improving efficiency and improving total output through this mechanism. So I think this is really interesting, but uh, it's super difficult to know how important that mechanism is in, in practice empirically. And so they calibrate a model and argue that, you know, potentially it can be quite important, which makes sense, like depending upon elasticities of substitution and so forth and the degree of variation across sectors and uh, uh, potential output th that can happen. But I think it would be interesting to know if that's actually true. Uh, that's important empirically. Does that rely on there being a positive correlation between efficiency and jobs at a steady pace? But you would think that would be true in equilibrium, right? Because uh, generally, there has to be some compensation for taking more risk. Jobs that are more risky and pay less would be just off the frontier. So the question sort of is... True, true, true. But I mean, those other amenities also have value and, you know, so... Um, so the point is, if workers are risk averse and this effect is actually big enough, then you actually don't face a trade-off in providing insurance. It might actually just strictly be better to provide insurance, both from an insurance point of view and from an efficiency point of view. So it would be an unusual uh, case, very strong argument for providing UI, if that were true. So as always, doing this type of empirical work on GE effects is quite challenging, but I think if one were to figure out how to do it, that would be in very important contribution. Okay, the last um, set of uh, issues I want to talk about are another, you know, another big part of this literature, which is actually very active right now, that we are not talking about here mainly because of time, is uh, the path of benefits or dynamics. So even though we talked about dynamic models, the only, if you think about the unemployment spell here, um, right, so this is weeks unemployed. We restricted attention to policies that looked like this. And actually, in the JP paper, I allow the benefits to end at some given point and then go to zero. Okay, but we only considered variation in whether it should look like this or it should look like that. But in reality, the government has lots of choice variables where I could set a different unemployment benefit if I wanted to at each point, right, at each week of the spell. And so if I think about, let's say, 50 weeks of unemployment, I have 50 choice variables in principle for uh, how I said I can set BT rather than just setting B. Uh, so that is a complicated problem. As we've talked about, it's a high dimensional problem because unlike in the, um, so in the basic dynamic search model where we're optimizing over the level of benefits, it's not that complicated because the worker is making many choices, but we're only ultimately optimizing over a small number of variables. And so we end up getting these simple formulas and it's very tractable to think about the optimal level of benefits because you reduce the dimensionality of the outer optimal policy problem. But here you have two very 
high dimensional problems where you've got the worker making 50 choices and then on top of that you've got the government making 50 choices. And that gets uh, really complicated. So that's what a lot of the focus of the current dynamic macro, new dynamic public finance literature is. So this type of stuff, and we also talked before about the capital income tax uh, models. So let me briefly describe what the intuitions are and what I think are some areas for future work. So a classic reference that uh, has, I think, the, the core intuitions nicely spelled out is a paper by Chevelle and Weiss in 1979 who solved for the optimal path of benefits in a three-period model, just to illustrate what the trade-offs are. So here's the key trade-off. If you have a benefit path that's upward sloping, so it looks like that, um, then you get more moral hazard. You have bigger efficiency costs because you get this effect where an optimizing worker is going to hold out to become eligible for these much higher benefits at the end of the spell. But you also have more consumption smoothing benefits because if you think about a dynamic model like the one we discussed, uh, the, the dynamic job search model, you are going to naturally decumulate your assets over time. So you're going to get poorer and poorer and your marginal utility of consumption is going to go up optimally. Uh, because you're hoping to find a job before, but you end up not finding a job, and so then your marginal utility of consumption is going up. And so the value of insurance rises over time. So that type of upward sloping path is beneficial from an insurance point of view, but it's bad from a moral hazard point of view. And then conversely, if you have a downward sloping path, like we basically do in the US where it's flat and then it gets cut off, that is good from a moral hazard point of view. But like in the current recession, if you're worried that the people who've been out of work for 80 weeks and uh, have run out of their UI benefits, those people might really be the ones who are in dire need of help, uh, then you're not providing them insurance when they could really use it, right? So um, what the new dynamic public finance literature does is try to characterize the optimal path of benefits in uh, these, um, in a richer version of this type of framework. And there are two approaches that people have taken, We're talking at a high level. One is a set of models where the government can directly control the agent's consumption path. So these are models where the agent is not able to make a savings decision on his own. On his own. So it's like in every period, I get to tell you, you get to consume uh, you know, $200 when you're uh, in week one of the unemployment spell, you know, $150 when you're in week 10 and so forth. So uh, mathematically, that's an easier problem to deal with than one where uh, you have what's called unobservable savings where all I get to set is the benefit level, which is actually true in practice, and you choose how much to consume in each period. So you're running up, you're building assets or you're borrowing or whatever. So uh, this first paper by Hope and I and Nicolini it does numerical simulations for the case where the government can control consumption and finds that a downward sloping path of consumption is uh, optimal. Notice that a downward sloping path of consumption does not necessarily mean that you want to have a downward sloping path of benefits because even flat benefits are going to generate a decay in consumption as people run out of assets. The the subsequent paper by Scheimer and Warning, and in particular the work that Ivan Warning has, uh, did in his job market paper and various other studies, was to show how you solve these models when you have unobservable savings, okay? Uh, where, you, where the government is setting the level of the benefits, but the agent chooses consumption. And there are various uh, results in that literature one of which is Scheimer and Werning 2008 who show that if you have perfect liquidity, so you have no liquidity constraints and you have a CARA uh, utility function, what ends up happening is that the problem basically looks stationary from the government's perspective in an infinite horizon model. So it, it sort of doesn't matter where you are in the unemployment spell. And as a result, the optimal benefit path ends up being totally flat under those particular assumptions. Now, you know, where, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just a question on this in terms of the methodology. If you're making those assumptions, which are in a way explicitly made to really solve the problem, do we still find that they're solvable? Um, okay. So, some th I, I think there are two different types of assumptions. <coughs> Something like perfect liquidity <coughs> clearly 
that can have a first order bearing as we've seen on optimal policy and so then one would want to you don't want to rely on the results you get making that assumption the assumption like carrier utility i think you need to think hard about what that functional form assumption is doing are you making any substantive assumptions but i think choosing functional forms sometimes that work out conveniently analytically uh, like certain constant elasticity specifications or whatever that I see as a little bit more innocuous because that's purely to get the algebra to work and is less of a substantive restriction than the perfect liquidity. But even care utility actually is imposing, it's making a specific assumption about how wealth effects operate, which is quite important. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so that's exactly, so that's one problem with uh, this approach. So, if you assume perfect liquidity and uh, you know perfect foresight, um, the uh, the problem you get, which I've mentioned a few times, is that the optimal benefit level is going to be very very uh, low because people can basically smooth on their own, right? And so when you look at some of the numerical simulations in these papers, what you see is that they talk about whether the path should be upward sloping or downward sloping, but you look at the y-axis and the numbers. And they're talking about going from a replacement rate of 1% to 2% or 2% to 0%. Like, you know, this is like totally irrelevant from a uh, quantitative, from a practical point of view. Uh, the, but the, the, you know, the problem is exactly that, that you're not able to generate a high level of benefits under these assumptions. So I was going to talk about, you know, with that, you know, exactly along those lines, what are some interesting directions for further work? One, to do this type of analysis in a model where either because of liquidity constraints or because people are not optimizing, there is actually a real role for unemployment benefits. Uh, and then two, um, I think the challenge, this comes back to your question about which assumptions to be b believed, this literature is very different from the other stuff that I've talked about in this class because it's not closely connected to the empirical work. So you don't get simple formulas out of these models that where you can estimate the parameters in the data and then say something about policy, partly because they're just really complicated. And I think we're just figuring out the work that Yvonne Morning and others are doing. You know, how do you uh, get closer to solving these models in a, and setting them up in a, in a tractable way? But d deriving these sufficient statistics sort of formulas from uh, these types of models is another, I think, important uh, area that we'll probably see work in in the coming years. So uh, the last thing that I want to say uh, on UI and sort of the theory of social insurance is something we've touched upon uh, several times. Let me just reiterate here. We don't have, in everything we've seen, we really don't have a model consistent with the data that can explain both savings behavior pre-unemployment, why people don't build up these buffer stocks, and search behavior post unemployment, meaning people are super sensitive to liquidity. So we see evidence that unemployment is in fact costly and that benefits can improve welfare a lot for certain liquidity constrained groups, but a simple rational model like the type that's being used in the new dynamic public finance literature can't rationalize the level of savings that people have when they get unemployed. And so as I've been stressing, I think an interesting general direction for future research is uh, optimal social insurance with um, these sorts of behavioral considerations of which the spin and win paper uh, is, is one example. So I'm going to stop there and then we'll talk about the other programs in the next.